In the book, Innovate Inside the Box, I talk about three types of learning that are really crucial. The first one is learning for your students. And we do that all the time in education. We go to professional learning opportunities, connect, you know, to be better for our students. The next one is learning about your students, who they are, what are their experiences, what are their strengths, how do we actually really get to know them, and how do we actually utilize that information to really create a powerful experience. And then the last one is learning from your students, right? And creating a space where you can learn from the the wisdom and experience and and what people bring. And what what I always say is that I always believe that teachers are the experts, but they're just not the sole source of information in the classroom. That there's so much wisdom and experience that that actually happens. And I try to model this uh, in my own work. I actually teach a, a graduate course at the University of Pennsylvania. And the way that I actually set it up is that I share information, share ideas, but I, I set it up where I can really kind of understand what are the goals, like who are the people that I'm teaching? They all have such different experiences when they go in. And obviously they're learning content. So that's, you know, um, you know, they're all there learning for themselves. But it's also, I set it up in a way that I can really get them to actually find a way to connect their current work to the course and really kind of amplify the the learning that they do in their work every day. I don't want people to be in this course and actually have to do it as an extra thing plus their job. I want them to make their own connections and learn. But what I love about it is I set up this space in a way that they share so many different experiences, so many different ideas and thinking that it really pushes my learning. Every single time I teach that class, I feel that I come out way better because I set it up in a way for people to really amplify their learning and really kind of share it and really kind of dig deep into it and me just to be a part of that learning. And I also encourage them to share the learning with other people around the world. And so this is why I wanted to talk about this, you know, prior to sharing my podcast today with Cass and Bratton, he is the director of learning at the Nanjing International School. He's an international educator and he has some really great ideas, some really great experiences But this all came in, uh, and I've done this before, from actually just wanting to kind of dig deeper into some of the stuff he shared, you know, in the class, because I thought it was really compelling, and I thought it'd be awesome not only to dig in myself, but also hopefully uh, you'll benefit as well. It was an awesome podcast, um, and shout out to all the international educators that listen to this podcast. Uh, I really appreciate it, but I know that no matter where you're in the world, you're going to learn a ton from Cass, and so welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I actually have today the Director of Learning from Nanjing International School. I actually thought I was going to get Nanjing wrong, but I had trouble with international. (laughs) International was the word I needed to practice. There you go. That's all right. It's okay. So I actually met Kasson um, through uh, a course that I'm teaching through the University of Pennsylvania. And um, like many of the students, he's just doing incredible work. And so I, I just said, I, I read Thanks. something that he wrote one day. And I was like, I'm going to get him on the podcast. I want to just hear about some of the experiences. And I actually, you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to talking not only about, you know, some of the stuff that you do in your school, but sure. maybe even I think I actually think you're the first. I don't know this for sure. I think you're the first international teacher that I've ever had. And I'm not, I'm not, really a teacher, I, not, not necessarily a teacher that teaches internationally, but it, like, I guess maybe I have yeah. like a different, like international teacher. Like you're like a, you're like a pub crawl of teaching. <laughs> is that, right? that is closer to reality than you can imagine. Right. Like that is kind of like, you know, you just kind of like <laughs> hang out at a school for a couple of years and then you go to the next, get on the bus and go to the next, you know, country. That's it. That's right? it. It is kind of true, right? It is a little bit. It is kind of true. Yeah, that, I've never heard it described that way, but that is spot on. That was that that was off the top of my head, man. So there you go. So, <laughs> so Cassin, if you can just kind of introduce yourself, uh, tell us who you are, what you do today, and how you got there. It's a great place to start. Sure. Uh, well, thanks for having me on. First of all, nice um, you have a huge you have a huge following in international oh. schools, by the way. Just oh, that's so you pretty know, cool. A whole untapped market. Well, um, yeah, maybe not after the pub crawl comments. No, I, maybe I more. So I have a, I have a feeling that'll resonate. Right. Uh, hi, yeah. So uh, my name is Cassin Bratton. I serve the uh, NIS Nanjing International School community as a director of learning. Uh, so my fourth year in this role. Prior to this, I was our middle school principal. 
um, which is also a job I loved. Um, I'm here with my, my wife's uh, primary teacher. Uh, we were talking about giving shout outs to our early years and early primary teachers uh, in, a, in a previous conversation. So definitely your wife. That's for your wife. Yeah. Your wife. Thank you, special. Olivia, there you go. <laughs> and uh, my son Harris is in grade five and just absolutely loving it. So yeah, we've been here in Nanjing for eight years. Um, and the school is just a great place to work and learn. So we we're, we're here. We're here for another few years. Uh, at least. So uh, we've bounced around. We've been on the pub crawl. Uh, we were in <laughs> Haiti and Scotland and uh, Doha, originally from Virginia in the States, uh, went to grad school in Oregon, just kind of all over the place. But uh, yeah, this is home. That's awesome. Hey, I guess so tell me like right now, director of learning, like what, mm -hmm. like, I, there's a lot of people that there's a lot of people I've connected with over the years, like that are directors of learning. So what, like, what does that job entail? Like, what does that oh, actually man. mean? Right? Oh, man, I was reading this Harvard Business Review article this week about <laughs> non-promotable tasks. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, you're under contract, so no matter what you say, they can't get rid of you. you got at least two more. No, I mean, so, so uh, in, I mean, I think it's, I think you're right. I think it, I think the idea of a director of learning or a director of, director of curriculum instruction or whatever, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's different in every school. Uh, in our school, it looks a lot like deputy head of school. So a lot okay. of the things I do, like timetabling, scheduling, calendar making, um, you know, sometimes high level disciplinary issues, supporting the director with all kinds of things, sometimes with right. the board. So a lot of what I'm doing is like, you know, deputy directing. Um, but on the learning side, the most exciting part of my job is that I work with our principals, with our primary and secondary principals and their teams. Right. Um on curriculum work, on our you know, unit planning, professional development is a big part of my job. So it's kind of a all encompassing piece mm -hmm. for us. It's basically, I do everything on the daily operations side that our director of operations and finance doesn't do. He does everything right. on the operations and finance side. So I'm on a small leadership team of the school director, myself and our director of, of operations and finance. And I'm also on our senior education team with our principals on the learning side. So it's a, it's a, Multi, let's call it a multifaceted right. role. Well, it, it, the one of the things that you said that I think really is important to me uh, is that you actually work with your your like school administrators to talk about learning curriculum development because I think a lot of times we they kind of I, I shouldn't say like I say we because I remember having to be a part of mm -hmm. this we kind of get lost in some of the politics of the job some of the you know operational all that stuff I, under, I understand that. But like one of the things I work with a lot of school districts and I'll say like, give me your administrators for a while, like, because I'm going to get your teachers really excited about, you know, some new opportunities for learning, but they can squash it immediately. Like, yes. cause I, and I'm, I'm like, I'm all about innovation. I'm all about empowerment, but I also want to please my boss. And if my principal says, no, nah, I don't want to do this because they, a lot of times those decisions are made not from a abundance of understanding, but from a lack of understanding, right? Sure. Cause they don't, maybe Absolutely. it's new to them. And, and then they actually can squash it right away. So I think, you know, really, um, like Tony Sinanis, like I remember he, he would always introduce himself as the learning leader of the school as a role mm -hmm. as a principal and how important learning was to that job. Right. And if you don't understand yeah. that, you can't be a part of that. Um, I think you, you can mess up some decisions. I, I'm curious about, um, some of the, like, here's something I, I kind of looking at like curriculum and instruction. Mm -hmm. and and your understanding of that but then when you had that understanding maybe in the role of a middle school principal do you feel you could do things a little bit differently do you think that you could make things happen like like i think sometimes when you central office you don't necessarily have the power to make things move as quickly as you can as a principal who has a deep understanding do you find some of that happening or like some of that maybe I don't know if it's frustration so like how do you deal with that no i mean you yeah i mean every you've hit no matter what the school context is that's right. it so like in international schools like all the schools i've worked in are are private schools mm -hmm. well, all the schools i've worked in abroad are private schools they're all k through 12 and the the stakeholders that the school's accountable to are the parents mm -hmm. the fee paying parents yeah. And in all the schools I've worked in, they've been nonprofit schools. So there's a elected volunteer board that has, you know, a narrow scope of role. Mm -hmm. So there's a board, there's a parent level. And then there's also obviously like the boss. So the school director is, mm -hmm. is like a, 
like a superintendent on a miniature scale on like right. a one school scale. Right. So in a way you would think that that would give you a lot of flexibility and, and quite a bit of autonomy as a school, because honestly you could pretty much do whatever you want, as long as you're able to maintain accreditation with, you know, whoever you want to maintain accreditation with, but that gives you a lot of scope. Right. But, but instead of being kind of beholden to, to initiatives or five-year plans from a central office, you're more, it's more that you're conscious of, you know, what parent expectations are, you know, are right. they looking for a more traditional education for their children in international environments? Are they looking for English? Like, right. you know, in a lot of the context, that's the big driver. Um, and then from the board level, you know, what are their expectations about how learning goes in the school? Um, so as a middle school principal, by the way, I think, I don't know. This might also be controversial. Being a middle school principal is like the best job. I love that. Oh man. Um, I thought thought I'd hate middle school and I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's the jam. And, and I think one of the things that on a systems level makes it fun is that parents are, I don't know, you get a little more flexibility sometimes uh, Mm -hmm. in, in those years. Um, the the stakes drop a little bit and things shift into much more of a social emotional um, focus supporting young adolescents as they progress through that those stages of their life. So um, I, I think you know in my current role we've had one of the things that really helps, especially in like a private school context or in a kind of a smaller you know microcosm of a district context, is that the mission drives the school. Right. Like the, so, so our mission is about inclusion. So that means when we're thinking about making decisions, it's about inclusion. Our mission is about creative thinking. That's what we're trying to achieve. So with that, if, if the organization really is mission driven and the board is really on, you know, supporting the mission, which they actually are tasked with creating. So right. there should be alignment there. Then as long as that's kind of your focus, typically you have quite a bit of latitude in how you do that. So we've tried all kinds of crazy things over my time here to try to be more inclusive, to try to be more creative. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, We've developed a a strategy about student voice and student choice, like a lot of schools have. Mm -hmm. Um, And that also helps because that helps sort of operationalize some of those big philosophical ideas to say, okay, yes, this is what we want to focus on. How, do, how might we do this through blended learning or how might, right. how might we do this through service or how might we, you know? So I think, I think um, there can be barriers, but it's kind of like, like in our course, like the idea of UDL is identifying barriers, right? You know, like trying to get ahead of that is, is kind of the work of the leader, right? To try to figure mm-hmm. out what those barriers might be and how can we get around them, over them, remove them, those kinds of things. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess they, that's a long answer to a short question. When they, when they, well, that's that's why we have a podcast, right? <laughs> that's why we don't tweet. <laughs> when we tweet these answers, but yeah, the, when, when you're when you're kind of going through that process and you have like this is, it has to happen. I'm sure this people are going to be interested in your in your answer to this, right? And you have like a lot of p- parental involvement, and mm-hmm. you know you you know probably in, in in your situation, you know parents are. I shouldn't say they're more active, but they're, you know, there, there is, there is a lot more kind of involvement at, at, a, at maybe in some, at some level, what happens when you have like conflicting ideals, like between parents, like, and yeah. here's the mission of the school. Here's, mm-hmm. you know, but this parent wants something totally different than that, you know, and they're, they're, you know, paying that process. Like what, what happens then? Like, what do you do? Oh, um, like, we're there's in a it. lot of conflicting what, parent views right now. And like, you know, it's getting complicated. Most definitely. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. So we have, you know, we've prided ourselves since, I mean, our school is about 30 years old. The whole time that the, the push has been around more innovative, inclusive education. Mm-hmm. Um, not because, not to do it just to do it, but because the school has always believed that that was the best way for students to learn, Mm -hmm. you know, having kind of Daniel pinkish sort of mastery autonomy purpose over their learning. And how might we do that in different ways? Uh, And design thinking was super important to us, you know, five to 10 years ago, as we have kind of developed a lot of this too. So there's, if, you know, teachers that work in a school like this, I think feel like they're part of, they have a lot of uh, autonomy. There's a trial and error culture 
And that's one of the things that's exciting. Students, I feel like, generally speaking, kind of go with what the school is going with, you know, as long as you're tuned into their needs and listening to what they want, you know, it's, there's a good symbiotic relationship between teaching and learning and student experience in in most schools, or at least in this school. And it takes a lot of work and it has to be purposefully done, but that's kind of the, that's the work, right? Like that's when you come to work every day, that's what you're kind of trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Our parents in my particular context come from traditional learning like very traditional learning environments in Korea, um, in Germany, in China, um, sometimes, you know, from other countries, but those are our kind of predominant kind of groups. And they don't necessarily, I mean, in their, in their corporate lives, like that's one of the good connections is like in their corporate lives, Mm -hmm. they are innovating. They understand what, you know, cultures of trial and error do. They understand how autonomy can lead to creativity and they get, they get it. Yeah. But then it's really easy for them to revert back to this idea of, well, I understand that you're doing project-based learning, or I understand that you've got, you know, this, this um, X block is what we called it. It's kind of a genius hour on steroids thing. Yeah. I understand you've got, you've got these things going, but you know, where's the rigor Right. And you're sort of thinking I have missed a step as an educational leader because I have not properly educated our parent community about, you know, what this is meant to be. So I think that's the key. And I I mean, honestly, I'm not exaggerating. I was thinking about this this morning on my bike ride because we just did a, a community survey. Like every year we do a community survey and we were getting the results back. And we expected it to be a little bit different due to COVID. We've had three different kind of lockdown moments and been in online learning and stuff. And we know that, you know, things are a little disconnected. And we also know that community for a private school and international school, the idea of community is like a value proposition. Like if you're thinking about spending all this money to put your kids in school, the community is something that we like to offer, but we haven't really been able to offer it because parents can't come onto campus pretty much all year. We haven't been able to have parents on campus. So when we got the results back, there is definitely a mismatch on, on some level between what we're trying to do and what we've been driving at and what our parents expect. And that is, I think it's a really cool opportunity Mm -hmm. and to some extent it's expected, but I think it's a really cool opportunity because that's really where I think, the rubber meets the road. If parents fully understand what we're doing and understand that we believe this is much more rigorous than, you know, drilling math problems. Right. And then they say, you know what? I disagree. I'm going to go to a different school. Like that is absolutely fine. Like school choice is a good thing, Mm -hmm. but I don't want to lose students or parents from our community because they don't get it. You know what I mean? And I think that's the key. Well, I I think, I I think, (laughs) And I, I'll be first admit that sometimes, you know, I was at fault for this too. You talk about, like I'm saying you as in me, right? You talk about mm-hmm. the idea of like project-based learning, innovation, all these things that are really important. And they're kind of where you're going to, but we don't talk about some of the boring, like foundational things that we, because that's not really exciting. It's just kind of like, that's just, you know, what we do Good to point. get to that point. And so then there is that mismatch because of what we, for, we tend to not focus on because I think a lot of people say like, Hey, it's like, I can go to this school that focuses on the basics or I can focus on, go to this right. school that focuses on innovation. They're like, well, no, this school is focusing on innovation through actually giving basic skills to get to that point. Yes. Not, it's not an either or, right. It's yeah, actually saying, dichotomy. how do we go Absolutely. be, how do we go beyond the basics? Not how do we neglect them? How do we go beyond? Yes. So I think that's a really important aspect. There's one thing that you yes. said to me and it reminded me of, I'm a huge basketball guy, Phil Jackson, my favorite coach ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, really when he brought the Chicago Bulls, I remember reading in his book, he talked about um, the players in his team, right? They they basically all, they, there's one Michael Jordan, right? And that's it. That's There's one Michael Jordan. He would actually do, he would actually have like individual he would get them all to read books, but not all the same book. He'd say like, hey, this person should read this book, this person should read this book. And he really understood the strengths and what people brought to the table on his team, but they all still work to one, like kind of one vision. That's kind of what I was thinking about when you were talking about that. It's not about like everyone has to be the same person when you're walking out. 
it's like, hey, we are working toward this vision, but we are going to bring out the best in you so you can contribute. And I, I, I really love that. Um, as you're talking about um, some of the really amazing stuff that you're doing in your school and some of the thinking that's happening, I, I was think I and I wanted to ask you about this. The the one of the reasons I asked you to to be a part of this is because a lot of this stuff that you're talking about, I I knew about through what you were reflecting on and what you were sharing in my course. And, and for those who are listening, the way that I kind of do my courses, I say, okay, here's some content, here's some ideas. And what I need you to do is actually bring your own context into the course. I don't need you to, I don't need to give you information. And then you just tell me the information back, right? Like I need you to make the connections and and this might sound a little weird. We don't grade. It's kind of like, but we will say like, Hey, you gotta, maybe I didn't have to do this ever with you, but sometimes we'll say like, Hey, I, I need to a little bit, I need a little bit more here. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, really like, kind of like, really kind of like, I try to focus more on not assessing, but being really conversational, especially like these are all adults who, uh, you know, teach or in the profession. And I think when I, I, I was saying this to before, when we were talking on the podcast, I remember actually having a professor in university who didn't grade, who basically said like, Hey, find stuff you're passionate about, tie it in. And I thought he was the nuttiest person ever. I thought like, <laughs> this dude is insane. You've become the crazy professor. I'm, I'm not going to do any, I'm never going to do this. And I never actually was more into a class. I was never more focused. And I was like, I'm, I'm like, I'm the crazy guy. I'm that guy now. So like, <laughs> so like, how did you, find that process where there's like, Hey, there's some stuff we obviously want you to kind of tie into your work, but it's really about you kind of you figuring out the connections, not me. Right. Like how yes. did you find that process? I liked it. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Um, I think I liked it because, you know, adult learners, first of all, but I mean, it's applies to children true, but adult learners, everybody in that course is like a full time hardcore curriculum instruction, learning, right. dealing with COVID, you know, crazy um, reality. And, but everybody also signed up to do the course. So, you know, right. everybody has yeah. a kind of a common interest. And I think what I really liked about the model you're describing is that a lot of what you were talking about in terms of like implementation science, let's say, yeah, it's happening all around us constantly. Right. There's so many examples and actually like work underway you know, like mm -hmm. not just things I could dig up from the past, but like things that were actually happening right now in my context that I could use to reflect on, to maybe tinker with within the class. And then that was what you were seeing. Like you yeah. were seeing the work that everybody's, you know, doing in the moment. And actually, like there was one assignment where we were wrestling with some, you know, it was, it was about like um, UD, early UDL implementation. We were having a, a faculty meeting like a few days later. And on the leadership team, we were discussing about, you know, how do we, how, how do we do this in a sustainable way? We don't want to go too fast, but we feel like we need to move forward. And that the comments that I got back from you and from Katie mm -hmm. Novak and from different classmates actually helped us put the brakes on something right. that we needed to put the brakes on, you know? So like, I think that is why it, why it worked, you know, because it was, it was contextual and I got to make all the connections. So uh, in other assignments, I could go back, you know, to yeah. my first grade teacher, or I could go back to, you know, things early, early in my career that I've, you know, struggled with, or even look forward, like, how is this going to be? So in it, you could pull kind of through time as well. So I, that's what I liked about it. Well, the, so one of my kind of philosophies is the idea that all learning is personal, like all of it is personal, right? Yeah. So when I talk about this, everyone that comes in there has a certain amount of experience and knowledge, right? And it's all different everyone's looking for something specific to get out of that process. Right. And yep. something, and everyone will learn something different. So it's kind of like, I think a lot of times in education, we're trying to make, we're trying to personalize learning to get everyone to do the same thing where I'm like, no, I already know you have jobs. I already know you're doing this work. Mm -hmm. So like make this course as a way to like do better at your job and actually connect the two, not, you, Hey, yeah. while you're working, you also have to do this course that has nothing to do with anything else. So you can check a box so you can get right. And that, that's me. Like right. I, I went through that process myself when I went, um, through my like master's work 
I, I tied everything into my job where I felt it wasn't, um, yeah. it wasn't like a, an additional thing. It was, it was like an amplification of what I was, my, my role at the time. Right. Yes. So, so I, yeah, I, and, and yeah, I mean, that just made me think of, you know, one of the criticisms of that approach. I mean, we have it sometimes with our own, you know, when we try to design learning the way you're describing yeah. is, well, what about, what about students that just, you know, they're just there to get through it. You right. know, in other words, it, you know, ticking boxes is really the goal. And what you're describing the way that, that that course was designed is like, even if you were that person, like you were just there because you wanted on your CV, you know, you, right. you don't really care about the actual learning at the, at the outset. If the assignments are designed well, you can't help but right. engage with them on a personal level because they're about you, not mm -hmm. about the, the content, you know? And I think that that's also a really powerful lesson is when things are designed in a more open and trusting way you versus a regurgitation of information, you catch some people that might just be there for the tick box, right. but actually like they don't have a choice. They have to engage with the material. And that's, what's kind of cool too. The, 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 the thing that I remember saying this, I, it, to this, this group, that one of the first thing I said, look, we're going to do learning in a little bit different way. And if you appreciate it, if you appreciate the, the delivery and how you're going through the experience, I do expect you to do this with your students. I do expect you to kind of like yeah. create the same experience. Don't go like, Oh, I love like the conversational style of assessment, but <laughs> grades, right? And like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, this, this is meant to kind of, kind of think like, how could I actually create? Not uh, how can I recreate this experience with my students by you know going through it, not just reading mm -hmm. about it. And I think, or you know, like hearing a lecture about it, but not actually experiencing it. Um, I know that probably people are going to be interested in your experience as an international educator and like. Like, why did you do it? What's that been like? So like, what, I, I feel, I, I'm like, I feel like I'm the most boring person. I would never do it. I am like such a baby. <laughs> I, I like, I, you know, we, I talked to another podcast, like I get, my stomach just cannot handle like <laughs> certain foods. And I like, you know, I've had some bad eating experiences across the sure. world and I'm like, it wrecks everything for me, but like, it's some of the, um, you know, like, we were talking before some people that I know wanted to have a two year experience at a different school and they just want to do that. Come right back to Canada, come right back to the U S come back to North America. Mm -hmm. And they, I, we had, they are gone, they're done. Right. And they're like moving country to country and country. So like what, what actually like what, what triggered you to go in the first place? Right. Yeah. And like, and, and why have you stayed so long? What's it, what's the experience been like? Yeah, good question. I think um, I'm just hoping this I is like, yeah, I got in trouble with the law. <laughs> <laughs> I wish things. it was that interesting. Yeah. I, I actually think the first thing is like being aware that it exists. Right. You know, there are hundreds, if not thousands of international schools all around the world. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that I knew about it was because I had uh, family members, my aunt and uncle, were working in an international school in Egypt when I was growing up. So I knew that, that, that existed, you know, kind of tangentially. And then when I was becoming a teacher, I guess, and I know teachers will, all teachers will resonate with this. There's like push and pull factors, mm -hmm. you know, like working in, in public school in the United States is, is a heroic job, you know, right. really in any system. But, you know, there are certainly some push factors. I mean, you see that with the rates of teacher attrition. Right. Um, I mean, COVID has exacerbated it exponentially. Hopefully things will eventually kind of settle back into place. But also next like, year, next year, they will. Yeah, exactly. But also like, you know, some of the right. like I'm right now, I'm an Indiana resident. Some of the things that are going on in Indiana around education are right. It, it's it would. That's why I say it's heroic. Like you've really got to, yeah. you know believe that every child needs a teacher and that you are there for the kids. Um, so for us, for me, it was kind of, there was kind of this push factor of, you know, is this really where I want to spend my entire career? And then there were pull factors, which is like travel and exotic right. experiences. And, you know, I had only worked in public school. So working in a private school, working in a K-12 school versus just in a middle school or a high school, those are all kind of 
kind of pull factors too. And, you know, most the lifestyle of most international school teachers is pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it's really hard when it's hard. It's really hard because your family's not around you. You know, you know, we have our son, he's, he's been growing up away from his grandparents, you know, and you know, yeah. th there's hard, there's really hard things about it. There's also great things about it. So I think as from the professional side, one of the best things about it is that each school has a great deal of um, latitude to um, achieve or push forward towards a vision that is mm -hmm. unique to that community. And I think as an educator, you get a lot of slack in how you approach teaching and learning. And that's really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. Very rarely is international education driven towards a test, although you could argue that some models like the International Baccalaureate are right. still driven by by an, an exam. And of course, our students are, you know, they're taking the SAT and they're really excited about that. And the parents are nervous about all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But we don't have like state testing requirements and that kind of thing that can sometimes hijack, you know, creative thinking and just mm -hmm. kind of put it on one single track. So that's kind of why we've stayed in this in, in this game because mm -hmm. our now our son's growing up and we really like the way he's developing as kind of a, a global citizen. I know it's kind of a cliche, but like, yeah. you know, his friends are Chinese and Korean and Mexican and Swedish. And, you know, mm -hmm. he's having experiences that he probably wouldn't have as much of. I mean, those experiences still exist in national right. systems in the States, but not to the extent. So, yeah, that's we love it. So this is so I, I'm going to. I want to make an observation of something I noticed and I'm, you tell me if I'm totally off here. I found okay. that it was really interesting when I visited, you know, and spoke at some conferences at some international schools that there's a very like, obviously transient population, like a lot of teachers that are in and out, but it was like so welcoming and like so familiar too, right? Like it's both. It's not like, like even if you're there temporarily, there's such a collegiality yeah. between educators in those For spaces sure. because because maybe maybe it's part of it because it maybe like everyone's away from home a little bit maybe yes I'm, right is that would that be an accurate assessment I that know would it's be very man it's like it's like you it's like you work here <laughs> you're describing right, right. you're describing what it's like and I also think that one reason it's that way is because that's how we design it for students mm -hmm. because students are transient. That's, yeah. So the whole, the way that most, I mean, not all international schools are the same. You know, there are, there's a wide variety of kind of business models and mm -hmm. approaches. Some schools are international and name only. Some yep. schools are super, you know, um, completely committed to the idea of international mindedness. But in general, I think international schools are designed so a student could leave here. Like a student in my class is moving to Warsaw, Poland. Like they're going to go to to the American School of Warsaw, and it's going to feel a lot like Nanjing right. International School. Right, and I think it's that way for teachers too. You know, teachers are moving around, and it's exactly the same thing. You know, more or less, it feels pretty similar. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, hey, anyone wants information, Casson will hook you up. So just I'm not trying to drain the talent talented <laughs> right. teacher pool of Canada and the United States, but right. if you're it makes a lot of people you know, listening, are like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go. <laughs> That sounds awesome. Every child needs a teacher. That's right. I agree. Casson, seriously, it was awesome. And thanks for, I know you're, it's like 6 p.m. here. It's 8 a.m. there. I really appreciate you doing this before your school day. And My now you're going to work all day and I'm just going to go yeah. watch sports. So I'm Fantastic. Like, right. So Casson, everyone, yeah. uh, make sure you connect with Casson. You can see his uh, details below. Um, and I'm sure he'll, he'd love to answer any questions, but you're doing some incredible work. Give a shout out to uh, Craig and, uh, your staff Will there. And yeah. And thanks. Thanks for your kind words too. So everyone, thanks for listening. Cass, and thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks, George.